welcome everyone to this evening's presentation, Why the Nazis Looted Art and Why It Still Matters. On behalf of the University of Denver, Holocaust Museum, Houston, and the Program in Jewish Studies at Rice University, we welcome you to an enlightening talk featuring Dr. Elizabeth Campbell. My name is Mary Lee Wiebeck, and I am the Holocaust and Genocide Education Endowed Chair at the museum's Boniac Center. Before we begin, I would like to share some logistical information with you. Um, during Dr. Campbell's presentation tonight, um, participants' mics will be muted. Uh, your hosts will be using the chat function. Um, and we will look forward to engaging in a question and answer period after Dr. Campbell's prepared remarks. To do that, we will ask that you input questions for Dr. Campbell using Zoom's Q&A function, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. And now let me introduce tonight's speaker, something I've been waiting to do for several months now. <laughs> Um, Dr. Elizabeth Campbell is an associate professor of history at the University of Denver and the founder and director of the Center for Arts Collection Ethics, which she began directing in 2018. Dr. Campbell teaches courses in modern European and French history, including the French Revolution, Europe during the World Wars, and Nazi art looting. In her first book, Defending National Treasures, French Art and Heritage Under Vichy, published by Stanford University Press in 2011, Dr. Campbell used French archives to assess how curators and museum directors at the Louvre um, attempted to acquire plundered works, complicating a dominant narrative of anti-Nazi resistance among French museum staff. With support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, her forthcoming book, Museum Worthy, Nazi Art Plunder in Post-War Western Europe, which will be coming out from Oxford University Press, Dr. Campbell examines the recovery of Nazi looted art, um, comparing restitution practices in France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. In all three settings and cases, post-war governments held unclaimed works for display in state-run museums, extending the dispossession of Jewish owners wrought by the Nazis and their collaborators. As the founder and director of ACE, Dr. Campbell is dedicated to developing training and for current graduate students and emerging museum professionals, highlighting the importance of provenance research and museum transparency. You can find Dr. Campbell's illuminating commentary on the legacy of Nazi art looting in various important media outlets, including the New York Times, the LA Times, Slate, Time, Newsweek, and the art newspaper. We certainly look forward to engaging with Elizabeth tonight with her passion, her eloquence, and her inspired work towards recovery, restitution, and justice. Um, over the past months, as we have prepared and through the historic Texas freeze, I have really been looking forward to what I am going to say next, and that is welcome, Dr. Elizabeth Campbell. Thank you very much, Mary Lee. Um, before I start my slideshow, I would just like to extend thanks to, to you and to the, the staff uh, at the Holocaust Museum Houston uh, and for everyone for joining us this evening after the delayed program. We were so pleased that we were able to reschedule this event and uh, we admire your resilience <laughs> um, and you know we just send our best wishes to all of our partners there in Houston and everyone who might be watching in the Houston community. Uh, we, we send our best. We know it's a long recovery process um, and we know that many of our partners helping with this event individually experienced 
the burst pipes and flooding. And so we're just so grateful uh, that we could end up rescheduling this event tonight. Um, so along with Mary Lee, I want to thank uh, Tamara Savage for her uh, help in planning this event and Chris Hendrick for bringing together all the, the technical aspects of tonight's program. On the DU side of this partnership, this is also being co-sponsored by the Holocaust Awareness Institute directed by Adam Rovner with assistance by Ingrid Weher and our amazing advancement and marketing team, Jennifer Garner, thanks very much, Laura Miller, and doing behind the scenes work, our ACE graduate assistant, Lauren Turner, who has really helped to push out information on our social media channels. So thank you for all of the work that, that you are doing. So we are in this very strange pandemic environment, um, but there is a silver lining. We actually can reach a wider audience than probably would have been possible in a typical on-campus program. Our initial plan was that I was going to travel to Houston. Uh, we had to modify those plans, but there are more than 300 registrants <laughs> for tonight's event, um, which is really an incredible uh, turnout. And so we're really happy to have so much interest. And we know that we have uh, people watching in Europe. So if you're still up and watching in Europe, thank you for staying up late for us um, to cover this uh, important event. So I'm going to start my slideshow and share my screen with you. Okay, the magic of technology. Um, so turning to um, tonight's event, uh, the topic of Nazi art looting has become pretty well known among a, a wide public in recent years. And it's due in part to some very popular books and films. And if we were in an auditorium together, this is the point where I would ask how many of you saw the Monuments Men film with George Clooney and Matt Damon? And I would expect many of you to raise your hands. Um, it had quite a lot of commercial success based on the book by Robert Edsel. It was a New York Times bestselling book. So um, perhaps you're also familiar with, uh, with his writings. Uh, the film certainly brought the issue of Nazi art looting to a much wider uh, global audience. I've written some commentaries on the film. Uh, at the end of this slideshow, I'll provide a URL for our website and blog for the Center for Art Collection Ethics. And you'll see some pieces that I have written about the film. There is some significant fictionalization that happens. Um, and you, you can see in this poster, we see all the, the men. This really was a, an amazing cast um, portraying the cultural officers. Um, we don't see Kate Blanchett in this version of the poster, uh, whose character was inspired by Rose Vallon, a uh, member of the French resistance who tirelessly worked to rest to works of art, not only to owners from France, but across Europe. Um, and so Kate did not make it onto this version of the poster, but I always like to refer to these cultural officers as the monuments men and women. It's very important to remember that there were key women who played a very important role, uh, including Rose Vallon, as well as others uh, in the what's called the MFAA. So that was the, the division that rescued uh, works of art and then went through a very long process of restitution. So we'll come back to, to that issue. Uh, you also may have seen the film Woman in Gold with Helen Mirren playing Maria Altman. Uh, this one I can uh, recommend a, a bit more from a historical standpoint. It really does get into some of the legal complexities. We'll come back to a couple of the key issues in this case that are relevant for cases that are still going on today. Um, but you might recall that Maria Altman um, received five clipped paintings from the Republic of Austria. The most famous one is Adele Bloch-Bauer. Um, seen here, but she actually received five Klimt paintings 
Um, perhaps you've actually seen this painting commonly referred to as Lady in Gold or Woman in Gold, uh, which is at the Neue Gallery in New York. In addition, perhaps you've read Lynn Nicholas's Rape of Europa, uh, which came out in 1994. There is also a very good documentary. Uh, so I highly recommend that if you're interested in this topic and have not seen that documentary yet. Um, it, it was inspired from the book and has expert testimony from a lot of uh, important researchers and historians. So I, I also uh, recommend that one as well. So going back to the film, The Monuments Men, you might remember that there are two major works of art that play a really important story in that film. It's the Ghent altarpiece, which is shown here on the left, and Michelangelo's Madonna, which is uh, on display at a church in Bruges. So these two items, undeniably masterpieces. Um, if we were all together, I also would ask how many of you have seen these works of art in person? <laughs> And uh, you know, I would be among the fortunate ones uh, who has been able to see them in person. And they are the types of works of art that make you feel changed by viewing them. It's an edifying experience to view them. So they were important. Their discovery was very important. Uh, there are very powerful accounts written by the cultural officers who did find them in the salt mine at Alto say in Austria. Um, and their return was a symbol of um, victory over the Nazis and for the Belgians, a, a great symbol of the, the restoration of their natural heritage. My critique of the film in the fact that it focuses on these two pieces so much is that it's very easy to miss a central element of Nazi art looting. And that is the connection to the Holocaust. Nazi art plunder was a fundamental part of the Holocaust. And one can watch that film and not realize how many works of art were actually plundered from Jewish owners. And so that is, um, one of the central points that, that I want to make this evening. We have to remember that systems of dispossession preceded deportation. And so I'm going to be, keep coming back to that point. Systems of dispossession preceded deportation. And those mechanisms of dispossession weakened impoverished members of the Jewish community. And by the time the deportations of the final solution were systematized in 1942, this was a population that had already been stripped of rights incrementally and of property. And works of art were just part of that property that was, that was looted. Um, there was also real estate, bank accounts, insurance policies, uh, a wide range of assets that were seized from Jewish owners. And so uh, that's a part of um, my central point here tonight is to make sure that we, we understand Nazi art plunder as an essential part of the Holocaust. So there are three main questions that I want to address tonight. Uh, why should we see Nazi art looting as really uh, a, a central aspect of the Holocaust? What role does expropriation play in the Holocaust? And why are restitution claims still active today? I'll go over a few case studies of uh, ongoing cases. And finally, what can we do as the, a public that loves art and museums? Uh, what can we do to help promote uh, ethical stewardship as the legacy of Nazi uh, art plunder continues to impact the art world today? There's a common question when people are, are learning about Nazi art plunder, and that is how many works of art were lost. And for people who want a very specific number, they're going to be disappointed <laughs> because you know, historians will say the archives are still being declassified and it's very difficult to give a precise number. Uh, a common number that is often given is that it's several hundred thousand works of museum quality art. So 600,000, uh, perhaps as many as 100,000 still missing today. 
but there are difficulties in trying to come up with an exact number. And other historians would say, you know, we still don't know enough. Um, even though the Nazis did keep meticulous records, there are various methods of counting. Does a silver tea set represent one item or 12 items? Um, at what point is an object art? Household items were plundered as well. At what point is that tea set considered art and museum worthy art? Um, and we have difficulties knowing still how many, uh, how many were destroyed in the war, how many have ended up in attics, how many were taken away by, by soldiers of all armies uh, involved in the war. So um, we are still figuring out the numbers. But what we do know is that the, the Nazis plundered millions of cultural items if you consider furniture, musical instruments, archive collections, books, manuscripts, um, a wide range of cultural items, it's in the millions. And also what we know is that as the Nazis orchestrated the Holocaust, they carried out the greatest cultural heist in human history. So that is certain. <laughs> Okay, so looking at Nazi art looting, a, another question that comes up is why would the Nazis spend so many resources, so much uh, time and energy and um, be so fixated on acquiring works of art? Well, as you um, might know, Hitler was a failed artist himself. He had twice tried to be admitted to the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts and was rejected. If you have seen examples of his uh, paintings, they surface on the internet from time to time, uh, you can see why he was rejected. <laughs> um, but he fancied himself a real connoisseur. And he was determined to build a, a great art collection. This, the title of this painting, I think, signifies um, his goals as a, as a, a leader who promoted the art. You can see the, the, the title of this work, um, the, the leader who revived German art. So he had a clear sense of what he believed was good art and what was bad art, as did uh, the other Nazis. So before the war, the Nazis purged from German museums works that they considered what they called degenerate. Uh, and so they targeted works that were in particular surrealist, expressionist, cubist. Uh, they felt that they showed um, a degeneracy that was um, widespread in the population. And there's a really tragic parallel in the way that the Nazis defined both degenerate art and degenerate people. And it's, um, visible in, in, in this image. Um, uh, sadly, they also found people who are mentally and, and physically disabled um, to be degenerate. And these were among the, the first victims of uh, forced sterilization and euthanasia. Um, so there's a, a very um, disturbing and tragic parallel in the way that the Nazis defined degeneracy both in, in people and in art. They staged an exhibition of uh, degenerate art in July of uh, 1937. They uh, systematically went through German muse museum collections and purged museums of art that they considered degenerate. And you know, many of these today would be considered ma you know, modern masterpieces like Picasso, Chagall, uh, and in total purged around 17,000 works of art, paintings and graphic artworks from around 100 German museums. And they staged a grand exhibition in July of 1937 to show the public this dangerous art. And when thousands flocked to see this art, Goebbels said, oh, there's a, such great response to uh, people supporting our idea of degeneracy, when for many of those visitors, they feared it would be the last time that they'd be able to see um, what they 
considered great um, modernist works of art. So then what did they want to create instead? Um, as, as you may know, Hitler wanted to create a vast cultural complex in his hometown of Linz, Austria. And this complex would have included a library, a symphony hall, a theater, and a museum that would be the finest art museum in Europe, far outshine the Louvre. And that was a major impulse uh, behind the art acquisition. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that Nazi art plunder not only means theft, but also purchases, dominating the art market. So Hitler hired top curators and dealers who worked for him and found out after the invasion of uh, Western Europe in particular, and they dominated the art market and they acquired works of art uh, through purchases and varying degrees of coercion and, um, and duress experienced by the sellers and particularly by Jewish owners. So he had in mind this vast museum that would be established in Linz, Austria, and he managed to acquire around 7,000 works of art um, that were meant to go to, to Linz, Austria. And other top Nazis, Goering in particular, also were avid art collectors. And art um, you know, became a key way that they offered gifts to each other. I'll show you some, um, some slides of that uh, uh, in, in a moment. Um, so as Nazi art plunder was, uh, was getting underway, it's important to keep in mind that there were these systems of dispossession that first were implemented in the Third Reich and then were implemented in occupied territories after the, the German invasion. So Nuremberg laws of 1935, Jews lose their citizen, citizen, excuse me, citizenship rights. Uh, so imagine all the, the rights that go along with citizenship. Um, in addition, Jews are forced to submit property declarations updated every three months. So the Nazis had clear records of Jewish assets. And again, not only works of art, but a, a wide range of, of assets. For businesses owned by Jews, there were Aryan trustees that were assigned to run the businesses and the liquidation of assets. There were limits on Jewish employment, keeping them out of cultural and educational fields in areas where they would have an influence on the public. So these measures were implemented in the Third Reich, in Austria with the annexation of Austria, the Anschluss in 1938, and then anti-Semitic measures implemented in occupied countries as well. So I'm gonna really be focusing on Western Europe in this talk. Uh, so th through the governments of the occupied territories and um, willing collaborators, anti-Semitic measures were implemented in those areas as well. And of course, you can imagine that once the Germans invaded Western Europe, this opened a vast treasure trove of uh, cultural assets, uh, especially in France. And the Nazis targeted the assets of enemies of the Third Reich. So they weren't trying to access Louvre collections during the war. Hitler had in mind that that would be negotiated with a final peace treaty, but they did try to acquire the assets of enemies of the Reich. So that included Jews, Freemasons, communists, um, but it was especially Jews and, and more so in France uh, than in um, the Netherlands and Belgium and Luxembourg. It was especially in France where there were Jewish collectors with very sizable uh, art collections. So I mentioned that the Nazis gave gifts to each other in the, the form of art. Uh, and so it was, they saw it as a real sign of their status and uh, that it signified them as a cultural elite. 
uh, were used to thinking of the Nazis in their cruelty and their barbarism, but they saw themselves as very civilized and that their art collecting was a, uh, a way of showing how civilized they were and that they could appreciate great, great works of art. So we have a couple images here, Himmler offering Hitler uh, a gift and uh, Hitler offering one to, to Goering. You might remember from the film, The Monuments Men, uh, the scene of Goering uh, strolling through the Jeux de Palme Museum in Paris, which became really a collecting point for the Germans where works of art that were plundered uh, were sent and inventoried and then sent off to repositories in the Third Reich. So this is a scene that actually is quite accurate. The Goering several times went to the Jeux de Pomme Museum and um, selected works of art that, that he wanted. There's also a great scene where Kate Blanchett's character is instructed to prepare cham champagne glasses for the, uh, the German officers that are there. And uh, she spits in the, in the glass before, um, before the champagne is poured in it that, to convey how she felt um, about the Germans who were operating in that museum. But at the same time, she was also very closely tracking their activities. And she has a, a, a fascinating memoir, Le Front de l'Art, um, that explains her work during the, the German occupation. So as I mentioned, as we're talking about plunder, it's very important to keep in mind that we're not just talking about theft, uh, which did occur. Um, when there was theft, it was from homes after uh, individuals had been arrested. It was seized from homes when people had fled. In France, for example, if a, a Jewish owner fled and escaped if they had the resources to do so, we're talking about wealthier, let's be clear, we're talking about the wealthier individuals with great art collections and had the resources and connections to flee. Their assets were considered to be forfeited property. Uh, and so um, I explain this process in my book, um, Defending National Treasures. Uh, so if this property doesn't have an owner, then the Germans used that as an opportunity to seize the property. And also uh, the French government then in, in some cases was vying to control these Jewish art collections because uh, for, from a legal standpoint at the time they were ownerless. Um, and this was a, a moment where the art market was absolutely booming during the occupation in Paris and Amsterdam and in Brussels. So it's important to keep in mind when we talk about plunder, we're also talking about the power of the art market. This also makes restitution very complicated uh, because you know, this issue still affects cases today in terms of determining the extent of duress. So people look at prices and valuations before the sale, at, at the price point of the sale uh, to try to determine a level of duress. There's actually a, a colloquium that will be offered um, by the Louvre tomorrow, if you're willing to get up early, which I will be, <laughs> about acquisitions during the war. Uh, and so it's, it's a fascinating topic, and there's a lot of really interesting research being done right now, more specifically on the power of the art market, and it's, it's really crucial. So where did all of these works of art end up? Um, perhaps you've seen this image. We used it in our promotions. It's a, a quite well known image in the US National Archives. So the Germans used churches and castles and salt mines as repositories. Why the salt mines? Well, they were the works of art were protected underground from air raids and with the presence of salt, the humidity was lower uh, so that paintings could be uh, conserved uh, without getting too moldy due to the, the presence of salt. So that, that's why um, those mines were used as repositories. But you can imagine the challenge faced by the cultural officers, the MFAA, in trying to restitute works of art to rightful owners. Um, this is another very common image that you'll see. This is on the cover of Robert Edsel's book, The Monuments Men. Uh, the top step there, you see James Rorimer, who inspired Matt Damon's character in the film. He would later go on to direct the Metropolitan Museum of Art 
in New York. So it was a major figure in the museum world in the, the mid 20th century. So, you know, this is quite a happy image. I mean, it, we, we like these images of success in, in the recovery effort. And there is a real heroism. And if you read their memoirs, reading uh, Rorimer's memoir, you know, he describes in detail uh, what it was like to enter some of these mines. And um, it was very dangerous work carried out by people who were not at all trained um, to be descending into salt mines um, and recovering these works of art. These were cultural experts. So there is a heroism um, in that art recovery effort. Um, at the end of the Monuments Men film, we hear the narration by George Clooney and by the end of the war, he's speaking to Truman and he very tidily says, Oh, we're, we're working now to return everything to the rightful owners, which is a very nice Hollywood way of wrapping things up um, without getting into the very complicated issue of restitution. But of course, uh, this was a, a very long protracted process. And in many ways it's ongoing. It, it, that, that aspect of their mission is still ongoing um, to restitute works of art to, uh, to the rightful owners. This is an image from the central collecting point in Munich. There were several collecting points that were established in the Western occupied zones of Germany after the war. This does not include the Eastern zone. The Soviets played no part in this uh, art recovery effort. Um, and that's also depicted in the Monuments Men film that they viewed the art that they seized as trophy art and as reparations for the, the losses that they had incurred uh, due to the Nazi invasion. So these collecting points were set up in the, the Western zones of Germany. But looking here, this is just one collecting point and imagine the painstaking work of trying to return thousands, hundreds of thousands um, of items to the rightful owners. The Allies determined that the items would be returned to the countries of origin. So from this collecting point, um, they may be able to tell uh, an individual owner, but their goal was to return works of art to the countries of origin. And then each individual country had the responsibility then of restituting the items to an individual. So in some cases, that restitution was quite straightforward. So here we have Rorimer again in that left image. And uh, he found uh, jewels from the Rothschild collection. Uh, he's holding up, up there. You uh, might remember a scene from the Monuments Men film where they're at Neuschwanstein Castle. Uh, so you did, it was evident from uh, markings on cases and uh, crates and, and boxes where some of these items had come from. Uh, so for example, it was clear that those jewels belonged to the Rothschild family. Uh, Vermeer's astronomer, which is now at the Louvre, um, but it was very well known to come from the Rothschild family, which in itself received thousands of items just from that various members of that family alone. But beyond those great large collections, there were obstacles to restitution for, for many people. So lack of documentation. When people fled their homes or when they were arrested, the homes were ransacked and emptied. Everything cleared out. Um, any household item that uh, they could be used by the Germans, uh, there's also a lot of interesting work right now on the plunder of uh, household items. That would include documentation, any sales receipts, uh, insurance policies, documentation that would have been needed to prove ownership when people were asked to make claims. So the system that was put in place by each of the countries was that individuals had to make a claim um, and submit it to the, the national committee that was in charge of restitution. And then they would um, try to get those pieces uh, restored. So many of these families lacked the documentation. Then, as I mentioned earlier, the power of the art market and determining sales under duress. And this is a, a relatively recent 
concept of recognizing sales under duress. And in the early post-war years, when those sales were evaluated, they were often considered legitimate sales. So it's, it's really been in the last um, couple decades that there's been a greater awareness of forced sales and restitution granted, um, considering the power of uh, anti-Semitic persecution and why owners would feel compelled to sell works of art and to not consider those legitimate sales. There are statutes of limitation that varied from country to country. Even in the United States, uh, until recently, there were different statutes of limitation in California, in New York. Um, so we, we, we now have a, a more uh, uniform statute of limitation. I'll come back to that point. But um, that issue of whether claimants filed claims within a set time period also has been an obstacle to restitution. There's also been an issue of determining jurisdiction. If an heir is living in the United States, does that person have the right to file a claim against a foreign government, to enter into litigation against a foreign government? That was a key issue in the Maria Altman case and continues to be in other cases um, that, are, that are ongoing. So we had this initial rush of restitution in the early post-war years um, that really is carried out until the mid-1950s. And then we see a lull um, for claimants who were unsuccessful in getting works of art back. Uh, some didn't want to enter into uh, costly legal battles, couldn't afford to. Maybe they had received some assets back and decided it wasn't worth the, the cost or the struggle uh, to continue claiming works of art. Their cases had been shut down um, by various governments. And a kind of status quo developed. Um, and my, my forthcoming book looks at what happened in France, Belgium, and the Netherlands when the governments were left with works of art that were not claimed. And um, they had an opportunity to um, enhance their holdings. In some cases, it was a custodianship. Uh, in the case of France and others in uh, the Netherlands, I mean, they became part of the Dutch art collections. But they had an opportunity to expand the collections and not to to try to track down owners, starting from the work of art and finding the owners. That work is happening now, but that has been a very recent process. So after about the 1950s, there's a status quo that settles in. And this persists until the 1990s. So why are the 1990s a turning point? It's the end of the Cold War. Archives are opened up in, uh, in numerous countries that allow writers and journalists, uh, historians to pursue research on the Holocaust and on Holocaust era assets. Uh, there's an opening also with the 50th anniversary of the Second World War and a reckoning with that past. Um, and there's also increased activism of the heirs of victims who don't want to give up and who become more determined uh, to try to recover assets that were owned by their family members. And I have talked to some of those claimants for my book. Um, and for them, you know, they, they might be able to sell recovered art. First of all, much of that um, you know, the, the profit they might gain from a sale goes to legal fees, but it also is not really about the money. It, it, it's about recovering uh, a part of the family and the, the, the family history and honoring uh, the family that had been victimized in the Holocaust. So the 1990s are a big turning point. This is also when Lynn Nicholas's book comes out, uh, historian Jonathan Petropoulos, um, who has been quite prolific, has a, a new book out on uh, Goering's main dealer in, in Paris, 
Um, so I highly recommend that as a, a new book that has just come out. Uh, and Hector Feliciano was looking at that custodianship I mentioned in France about um, how the French government was handling works of art that it still held. So these books came out in uh, the mid to late 1990s and gained a lot of press attention as well. Here in the United States in 1998, a Presidential Advisory Commission on Holocaust Assets was created. So a real reckoning under the, the Clinton administration. This also led to a major conference in 1998. And you'll often see this referred to simply as the Washington Conference. And this one uh, was addressing Holocaust era assets, but led to some very important principles related to Holocaust era art. There is a set of non-binding principles that was approved by 44 countries, including Russia. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind, this is not law. These are non-binding principles. Uh, so what can 44 countries agree to, including Russia? And I wanna point out a, a, a key phrase from, uh, from the, the Washington principles. So we see that it says that every effort should be made to publicize art found to have been confiscated by the Nazis and not restituted in order to locate pre-war owners or heirs. So you'll notice that language is pretty vague. Uh, and so it leaves quite a bit of room. This is something that even Russia <laughs> can agree to. Um, but it, it did start very important uh, international conversations. There have been subsequent uh, big international conferences uh, since then. Uh, in Vilnius in 2000, in Prague in, um, in, in 2009. Um, and so it, it did help to contribute to greater awareness of Holocaust era art and for a need for provenance or ownership research. So that is a key impact of that conference. So what is some progress that has been made? So then in the wake of the, uh, the Washington conference, we see professional organizations like the American Alliance of Museums, the Association of Art Museum Directors come out with codes of ethics uh, regarding Nazi era objects and the need for provenance research. So here in the United States, we don't have a Ministry of Culture. Uh, so this is different from other systems in many European countries where it's a government that oversees uh, public art collections, art museums. Uh, here in the US, we have mostly private museums. Uh, so we have these professional organizations that establish codes of ethics and to maintain accreditation, they should be adhering to these codes of ethics. However, we, we don't have very strong enforcement mechanisms and with, with no ministry of culture, um, we don't have a strong way of ensuring that museums are carrying out the needed provenance research to the extent that they should. So this involves acquisitions, whether they are purchases and donations. And a common time frame is that also within permanent collections, anything acquired after 1932, so to cover the period prior to the beginning of the, of the Third Reich, um, acquired after 1932 and created before 1946. So covering you know, slightly beyond the whole period of the Third Reich, provenance research needs to be done to make sure that there isn't a break in that chain of ownership, trying to determine if there could have been a theft uh, in that period. Um, could this object have been in Europe during the Nazi era? So it really is a, a responsibility of museums to, to carry out this research and to make that information available transparently on websites. So this is an, an area of progress. If you go to 
uh, most museum websites, you're going to see a provenance page. So look for it at your at your museum uh, that you that you like to frequent or that you support, and look for the transparency. Um, and often the information that's given on those websites, it doesn't. The, the works that are listed um, don't signify that that work was looted. It signifies that there's a question, that it's possible the works exchanged hands in Europe during the Nazi era. Okay, so, you know, as researchers are, are carrying out this work, which is very time consuming, laborious, and expensive, that's a keyword. Uh, what kind of sources are they looking at? They're looking for evidence of sales receipts and insurance policies, photographs in, in the homes. Can they, can they see that a certain work of art was hanging on an owner's wall? They look at catalog raisonne. They look at exhibition catalogs um, and trying to trace that ownership history. And this can be in traditional archive collections in paper, uh, so throughout Europe and uh, the United States, or uh, they can be digital resources. There's also a good deal of evidence on objects themselves and particularly framed paintings. So here's a, a, a good example of uh, the back of a painting that tells a fascinating story. You can see all the dealers and custom stamps. Uh, and that is all really crucial evidence that can be on the back of a work of art. And you know, they also signify fascinating stories. So this is a, also a way that some museums are starting to approach the way that they display works of art and not just showing the aesthetics um, on the, the front of the painting, but what's on the back. And what can viewers learn about this object's biography? Uh, because there are fascinating stories about these works of art. And it's a, it's a totally different way of thinking about appreciating items and thinking not just about how it fits into art history, but what, it, what is this object's own history? And uh, so the goal of provenance research is um, not only to make sure that the museum is, is holding an item that doesn't have an illicit past, um, but also to better understand these items and to know their histories, communicate them to the public. Um, and they tell fascinating stories um, about an object's history uh, across oceans and time. So it's a, a different way of understanding uh, a work of art. Okay, another area of progress is a lot of uh, digitization of resources. And so this greatly facilitates the ability of, of researchers to try to make connections uh, in finding archives from uh, various countries that are now available online, many for free. This is, this is tremendous. So the power of the internet has really changed the way that people are able to, to carry out this research. Uh, here's an example of a database that's available uh, that lists objects that went through the Jeu de Pomme, that museum that Goering was strolling through. You can go through and see inventory cards uh, with records of uh, the dealer and the title, uh, sometimes the dimensions, that's a, a really important piece of the puzzle is knowing an object's exact dimensions to make sure that uh, you're talking about the, um, the type of the exact work of art that, that you're looking for. Having done some, you know, quite a bit of this research for my books, I can tell you um, how many works were just listed as landscape or Madonna and Child, <laughs> you know, many. And so, it, you know, that's another part of the complicating factor, but these digitized records will often contain exact measurements. And, and that kind of detail can help um, someone really make sure that they're tracking down the, the correct item and the correct owner. Okay, so we're getting greater transparency, 
more digitization. Uh, the Getty Provenance Index is another example that provides access to dealer stock books, inventories, sale catalogs. So that's a tremendous resource. Uh, there's a greater sharing of information. This is a, a screenshot of a page for the US National Archives. And you can see that they're providing links to other archive collections. So there's an uh, increased sense of cooperation with uh, various countries working together, knowing that um, they need to make these records available freely digitized online. There's also a very interesting project in the works, the Jewish Digital Cultural Recovery Project. And this one is doing a pilot project on the collection of Adolf Schloss. And I examine this uh, collection in my book, Defending National Treasures. It was a collection of 333 paintings, mostly Dutch and Flemish. This was the style that was most coveted by the Nazis. They saw an Aryan lineage with the great Dutch masters um, and uh, especially sought to acquire those, those works of art. Um, and the, the Schloss collection was plundered through a cooperation of French individuals as well as Germans. It was a true collaboration. Uh, and so there's a, a pilot project that is being initiated to bring together archives from various countries related to that one collection. And through this pilot project, they're going to be experimenting to see how can an organization like this bring together digitized records from various countries in a way that's really beneficial. Uh, and so they expect to finish this pilot project by the end of 2021 and then to continue expanding it. Okay, so we've talked about um, aspects of progress. So time to celebrate. This is an image of a US ambassador, Stu Stuart Eisenstadt, who played such a, um, such a large role in helping to negotiate settlements related to Holocaust era assets and in planning the Washington conference. Um, this is at the 20th anniversary of the Washington Conference uh, in Berlin, and he's shaking hands with Monica Gruters, the German federal government commissioner for culture and media. They issued a joint statement expressing great satisfaction with progress to date in a very optimistic way. Um, however, there is still uh, progress to make. Provenance research, transparency. Um, and some countries are, are farther along in these efforts uh, than others. And I would like to focus on a, a few cases involving the, the United States, um, just as, as some examples. So I want to I want to start with a case where the museum emerged victorious. We often hear about restitution stories and uh, we're hearing about a victory of a claimant that gets to be pretty dramatic. And sometimes it's because the works of art are resold for um, very large sums of money. And that, that's what happened with um, the Klimt paintings that were uh, recovered by Maria Altman. But here's a case where it was determined that the museum was the rightful owner. And so when we talk about you know, ethical stewardship, this is something that's, um, that's debated for the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena when faced with a claim, felt that it was worth a legal struggle to maintain the integrity of the collection. So this is one uh, these are uh, two paintings by Lucas Kronash the Elder, uh, Adam and Eve, and they have a, a fascinating history. So it's a complicated case, but I'm gonna I'm gonna just summarize it uh, fairly concisely. So these were paintings that were owned by the great 
Dutch and, and Jewish art dealer, uh, Jacques Houtstiger. He had purchased them in Berlin at an auction in 1931. So when the Germans were invading the Netherlands, uh, he had delayed in deciding whether to try to flee, but did uh, as the Germans were invading. Um, he fled um, on a ship with his wife, Desiree, and their infant son, and tragically died uh, while on the ship. He fell through an open hatch, uh, walking on a deck at night, um, and fell to his death. So Desi continued on eventually to the United States, and they had left behind tremendous assets in the Netherlands. The gallery in Amsterdam, as well as, you know, sumptuous properties, uh, so a great amount of real estate, as well as a stock of around 1,300 works of art, and many of them were uh, Dutch and Flemish masters. Again, that style that the, the Nazis particularly coveted. Um, these are examples of uh, German uh, Renaissance paintings. So Dizzy had sent instructions to employees in the dealership not to sell the works of art but she had no rights um, having fled uh, and the employees in the dealership ended up selling the collection and the stock to Goering and to an art dealer that was working with him, Alwa Needle. And after the war, the MFAA recovered around 400 works from the Houtsticker collection, but around 900 are, are still missing. In the early post-war years, Desi entered into a settlement with the Dutch government. And this is a complication with Dutch law that I'm exploring in my, in my next book. But there were funds set aside for her in the sale. This shows the complication of the role of sales in Nazi art plunder. There was uh, an account set aside for her, so she did receive some funds. And when claimants' families had received some funds during a sale at prices that were below market value at a rate that greatly favored the Germans, but they were seen as, um, they would be seen as benefiting twice if they benefited from the sale and restitution. And so there were significant fees imposed on claimants um, to repurchase the works of art that had been plundered through these sales under duress, as well as heavy taxes. So she claimed some of the paintings, but not all of them. Uh, and these two paintings were not among the ones that she recovered in the early post-war years. So the Dutch government holds on to them. And in 1966, there's an heir in the um, Stroganov uh, Russian dynasty, um, George Stroganov Sherbatov, who claims that the works actually had been plundered from his family in Russia by the Bolsheviks. So remember that Hofstikker had purchased these in 1931 in Berlin. Stroganov said they were there because the Bolsheviks, um, the Soviets were selling works of art that had been plundered from uh, the Russian elite, including his family. I've looked at those documents in the Dutch archives and the Dutch never felt that they had evidence that the, the paintings had belonged to the Stroganov family, but they were willing to sell them to him. So they sold them to him in 1966 and he in turn sold them to Norton Simon in 1971. And so that's how they ended up in the museum. So it was more than 30 years later that the heir to the Houtsticker um, estate, uh, Marie von Serre, uh, realized that the Norton Simon was holding works that were formerly in the Houtsticker collection. So initial uh, negotiations failed and she filed a restitution lawsuit in 2007 in a, a legal battle that lasted 11 years. And it went from district court to the Ninth Circuit, to the Supreme Court, which declined to review the case and back and forth for 
uh, 11 years and finally ended with um, the claim denied by the US Ninth Circuit. And a key issue was what's called the act of state doctrine. And it was based on the idea that US courts could not call into question the Dutch decision to sell the paintings to the Stroganov Sherbatov in 1966. And so then Norton Simon had clear title from that subsequent sale. So it's, it illustrates how long these restitution battles can last at great expense. Uh, the legal costs of, uh, uh, of these cases is also a, a deterrent um, for individuals to, um, to file claims. But there's one where the museum emerged uh, victorious in the end. Right, here's another example of a case that is still playing out in New York. Maybe you uh, remember hearing about this uh, a few years ago. Uh, so this one involves an individual, uh, a London-based art dealer, Richard Naji, who is currently holding, uh, he's, was the owner of these drawings by Sheila, uh, that he had been displaying in the New York art show and were discovered by the heirs of Fritz Grunbaum. Uh, Grunbaum was a, a Jewish um, entertainer in Austria and was also very strongly anti-Nazi. He was arrested in 1938 and um, was deported to Dachau where he died in 1941. These pieces appeared at a Swiss dealership in 1956. If you do some reading into these cases, Switzerland often <laughs> is involved, uh, involved in sheltering looted assets. And these were among drawings that appeared in a Swiss dealership in 1956. There is disagreement among researchers uh, today as to what happened to Grunbaum's collection between his arrest and when some of these works appeared in uh, this art dealership in 1956. But this case was heard in New York State Court and Justice Charles Ramos ruled in favor of the, the claimants. And he argued that the plaintiffs and that the, the researchers that they had hired were very convincing in uh, arguing that the works had indeed been stolen and that a good faith purchaser of stolen property cannot be the rightful owner. He also invoked a law from 2016, which is known as the HEAR Act. That's the Holocaust Expropriated Art Recovery Act. And that law was passed to facilitate the restitution of Holocaust era art. And one of the things that it did was to create a standard statute of limitation. So it removed the conflict I mentioned earlier about different US states having different statutes of limitation. There's a six year statute of limitation from the time of discovery when someone discovers that a museum and institution and individual is holding a work that they um, seek to claim. So Ramos uh, invoked the HEAR Act in saying that this was precisely the kind of case um, that the HEAR Act was meant to address. So ruled in favor of the claimants. Uh, it was a decision that was confirmed on appeal in July of 2019, but the case has not gone away. So uh, Naji continues to assert title and from the plaintiff's side, uh, they argue that they are owed pre-judgment interest based on the value of these drawings, that the value has increased over the course of this lawsuit. And so they are owed pre-judgment interest. So that issue is still being heard in New York courts. It's going back to trial court uh, where the interest of um, the, the issue of pre-judgment uh, interest is going to be determined. So you can keep an eye out for that one. Also, there's another case in the news today. <laughs> there is a, a story coming out. So this is this is not history. This is current affairs. So 
Uh, in recent years, you might remember hearing about this case involving the University of Oklahoma. So it's a work by Pissarro and it was donated to the Fred Jones Junior Museum at the University of Oklahoma in 2000. Um, there's a claimant in France, Leon Noel Mayer, who was um, the child of Holocaust victims. She lost a few members of her family. She's a child survivor of the Holocaust and was adopted by a family that had owned this painting, the Mayer family. The Mayers stored their works of art in a, a bank vault, and this painting was stolen from a bank vault. So it would, it's a clear example of theft. Um, many of these cases are complicated by sales, and so the notion of sales under duress becomes a really important factor. That's not the case here. It was clearly stolen from a bank vault, um, and so what should have happened at the University of Oklahoma, when it was donated in 2000, the university at that point should have done provenance research on these paintings. Keep in mind the context. This is after, this is an issue that's been in the news from the, the late 1990s. It's after the Washington Principles Declaration. It's when organizations like the American Alliance of Museums were issuing codes of ethics that provenance research should have been done uh, at the time of acquisition of these paintings. Uh, it was part of uh, a group of other Impressionist paintings that were donated to the museum. However, it was not done. So Madame uh, Mayer tried to enter into ne negotiations um, and this uh, took several years, but the parties reached a very interesting settlement in February of 2016. Madame Mayer was granted title, but they reached an agreement that the painting would go to France for a period of five years and then would return to Oklahoma and would go on display again at the University of Oklahoma so that there would be a rotating display. So the painting uh, would not disappear after an auction, that it would remain in public view. Uh, and um, Madame Mayer had has wanted this painting to remain in, in public view. So the University of Oklahoma abided by that side of the agreement and it has been at the Musée d'Orsay. Uh, so it is currently in France and is due to return to Oklahoma in July of this year. Madame Mayer wants to donate the painting to the Musée d'Orsay, which of course is known for its impressionist works they cannot accept the donation when there is this agreement of a, a rotating uh, uh, display. So Madame Mayer is trying to uh, keep the painting in France. As you can imagine, this is causing quite a bit of uh, debate on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, officials from the University of Oklahoma have said that the contract was sacred and that uh, it must be abided by. Uh, from the side of uh, Madame Mayer. Uh, she argues that she's a child survivor of the Holocaust and that the restitution of Holocaust era assets is sacred. So there is a hearing in Paris today and we're expecting to hear a decision by a French judge by April 13th. So keep watching this one. And I have uh, one more case study that I'll mention briefly. Um, we are definitely gonna come back to talk about this one next week when we have our, our panel of experts in our uh, follow-up program. Uh, so this one involves the Guelph treasure or the Welfenschatz that you may have heard about. This was recently in the news as uh, this is a case that was just heard by the US Supreme Court. It involves around 80 pieces of gilded and jeweled reliquary art. Uh, and these pieces had been sold by uh, Jewish art dealers in 1935. And today are held at the Museum of Applied Art in Berlin, which is overseen by the Prussian Cultural Foundation. The claimants in this case are US citizens and 
remember that issue I raised earlier. There's the question of whether US citizens can sue uh, a foreign government overseeing uh, these pieces. Lower courts had determined that the issue could be decided in, uh, in US courts. But um, and you might remember also this was an issue in The Woman in Gold, whether Maria Altman uh, could have that right to sue the Republic of Austria. In this case, the Supreme Court determined unanimously that what was at issue was really a matter of German domestic law. And it's a concept of domestic takings. Uh, when we talk about this case next week, we're going to have the attorney for the plaintiffs, uh, Nicholas O'Donnell, is going to be joining us on our panel. He'll be able to tell us much more about this. Um, but they focused, the US Supreme Court focused on the jurisdictional issue of German domestic law. But they remanded it to district court in Washington, DC. There is still a question about whether those art dealers were German citizens at the time of the sale. So can it be considered what is thought of as uh, domestic takings um, in the context of anti-Semitic persecution that was going on in the Third Reich? So the case is not over. Um, and we'll look forward to hearing more from Nicholas O'Donnell about that case next week. OK, so I know I, I need to wrap up. I want to make sure that I, I leave us time for questions. So moving forward. Uh, what can what can we do to help promote uh, ethical stewardship? Um, we know that the legacy of Nazi art plunder still shapes the art world today. Support provenance research. Uh, it is time consuming, intensive, laborious, and very necessary. And it's crucial to ethical stewardship. Um, also, that research needs to be transparent. So look for it on the museums that you love and frequent and support. and. Um, make sure that you're seeing the kind of transparency that, that you expect from, uh, from those institutions. Uh, a goal of the Center for Art Collection Ethics is to promote ethical stewardship, not only in this area of Nazi era art, um, but you certainly have seen issues related to repatriation of African items. Uh, this has really entered the news lately in the context of the renewed Black Lives Matter movement um, and Native American claims for repatriation of especially sacred funerary items and even uh, human remains that are in many anthropological collections. So uh, a unique aspect of our center is that we promote ethical stewardship in all of these different areas. And uh, here at the, the University of Denver, we're training the next generation of curators. And I know from speaking with them uh, that this rising generation does have a, an awareness of ethical issues and uh, want to make sure that uh, museums are good stewards of the works that they hold in the public trust. And we have a unique kind of uh, program where we are going to be training graduate students and emerging professionals from a variety of backgrounds. I'm really happy to announce that we're planning a fully virtual program for this summer. We're planning it for August on fundamentals of Nazi era art provenance research. And I'm also delighted to announce that we've received support from the Crest Foundation to help carry out this project. So, um, and we're embracing the virtual environment uh, just like tonight. Uh, we can open this training to a much wider audience than initially planned. Eventually, we want to do this training. Uh, maybe we'll keep a hybrid approach, but we want to have some on-campus programs as well. We were supposed to run one on Native American collections last summer. We even had an excellent cohort of applicants, but had to cancel it due to the pandemic, but we will do it again. And we want to have a rotating set of programs addressing various aspects of ethical stewardship. So if you believe in what we're doing, support us. We need to keep this center going and uh, continue our good work of training the next generation of curators. So 
I want to just show where you can follow us. Um, this is our Instagram, Twitter, and our blog where we post news stories in, in all of those different areas and have a new section on provenance research at DU. We are carrying it out at our institution as well. Um, and with that, I, will, I believe uh, we have some questions I'd be, I'd be happy to answer. I'll leave this up here for just a minute. And if you anybody else has questions they want to add, um, please do so. So we have received a number of very interesting questions, Elizabeth. Um, one, of the, one of the ones that I don't know the answer to is, can you talk about the JUST Act? This is a question from Steve Katz. Yeah, so this was a, a law that was passed um, under the, the Trump administration. And the JUST Act is intended to uh, require the US State Department to evaluate progress in the restitution of Holocaust era assets in other countries. So mm -hmm. it doesn't affect US collections, it affects other countries. And I would be very curious to see the impact of that act. I, it was never um, entirely clear to me exactly how that would be carried out, who was expected to um, uh, compile the reports. I personally have not seen any of the reports if they've been issued. Um, so um, it, it, it was an act, I believe it had unanimous support in Congress. This is the type of issue that tends to get unanimous support. <laughs> um, and so that in itself is striking that so that lawmakers feel compelled to support this effort. And yet uh, it's the US trying to monitor the progress of other countries. Um, so I, I have not seen any results of that effort yet, but would be interested to see it. So, and I, so I was wondering, um, I'm doing some work right now in the Middle East. And one of the things that I'm reading about is all kinds of devastation that's occurred to the art culture of the Middle East. Uh, through ISIS and ISIL. And, um, you know, the many people that write about it point fingers and say, oh, they shouldn't do this, they shouldn't do this, they shouldn't do this. And yet, um, what have we learned from the past that can help us deal with these situations across international borders? Because the, the legal ramifications of, of this are so complicated. Yes, absolutely. No, this is a, a very important issue uh, right now. And there's there's an entire other field that's dealing with uh, antiquities trafficking uh, right now. Uh, and you, you might be aware that uh, traffickers have been using Facebook. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the context of the pandemic, they've been thriving on Facebook. And mm -hmm. so their, um, the Altar project has been involved in, in finding these organizations are really criminal organizations operating on Facebook and they've put pressure um, on Facebook to, to shut down the websites, but they, they still are continuing. It, it, it is a major problem and it's very difficult to stop because uh, customs agents often aren't trained uh, quite well enough to be able to determine whether an object is looted or not. There are many cases of uh, forgeries also online, people being taken advantage of. Um, and so it really is a significant problem. Uh, in New York, there has been a concerted effort uh, to try to prevent uh, trafficking and to prosecute dealers that are engaging in, in mm -hmm. trafficking and selling looted objects. Um, and so, you know, it's New York is a, a real center of the, the art world. Um, there really is a responsibility of dealers um, to ensure that the works that they are selling have, have not been looted. But uh, you're right that it, it, it really is a big challenge. So there is a question here about, um, and, and her, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, and Tarta. <clears throat> um, to other purge of modern art uh, prosecuted or, yeah, prosecuted by the Vichy regime. Um, how invested are Russian cultural institutions in codes of ethics regarding provenance related to this? 
Well, so the the Russians, as I mentioned, were part of the the Washington uh, principles. Uh, agreements and have participated in subsequent uh, big international conferences, but continue to assert that the, the works of art that they uh, seized in Eastern Germany and other uh, Eastern European territories, uh, that that is just reparations for the damages that they incurred uh, because of the German invasion of the, of the Soviet Union. Uh, and it, there does not appear to be willingness to budge. Um, so um, yeah, it's a, it's a complicated, <laughs> complicated issue. Um, but so far, uh, the Russians are um, quite intransigent on that point. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a story of one of the heroic acts of recovery that you're aware of. Because we all like heroic stories, and they're important when we're dealing with uh, quagmires, such as the ones that we're dealing with. Um, you know, I... Uh, or tell us more about Rose Vallon, perhaps. Oh, okay, sure. Yes, I'm happy to talk about Rose Vallon. Uh, so she's such a fascinating and complicated woman. Um, and you know, truly risked her life to carry out the, the work that she did at the Jeu de Palme as the Germans were working all around her. She was very crafty and understood German. Mm -hmm. And the Germans working all around her did not know that. She hid that fact from them. And so she could overhear their conversations. She took notes. She made copies of photographic uh, negatives. They were taking pictures of their plunder, <laughs> showing off so that they could report back to Berlin all of their uh, plundering efforts and their successes. She made copies of photographic negatives so that she had evidence of who was involved um, and knew that she was risking her life. There were a few uh, German officials who threatened her and made it clear that if she, if she was disclosing the information about the plundering, that, that she could be shot. And so she, she knew that uh, she was risking her life for this work. Uh, and then, you know, what also isn't as well known is that she really played a pivotal role in the restitution process and worked in Germany for several years and rose to a very high position. And she was, very well respected, um, uh, rubbed some people the wrong way. She was a strong personality. Uh, and that determination um, was not always welcome by some people that she worked with. She also is a complicated figure because she, on the one hand, was very dedicated to working to, um, to restitute works of art to France, first and foremost, she was a, a true French patriot. Um, though she helped other countries recover their works as well. Um, and she did help many Jewish families get works of art back. And yet, when there is an opportunity for French museums to have mm -hmm. works of art in this custodianship that I mentioned, uh, she did see it as an opportunity. And she oversaw the archives that could have been used to trace some of those pieces back to the rightful owners and did not. Uh, so in that sense too, she has to be understood in her time um, and was not taking that extra step to try to find the owners. The system of waiting for claims always persisted. Um, so it, it's, it's a complicating factor, but overall uh, really someone who um, is still an unsung hero uh, of the recovery effort. So we have um, a couple of questions that are asking us to talk more about uh, next week's panel. So yes. I'm that you can illuminate that for us. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm so glad. Okay, glad to be covering next week's panel. And I'm really delighted that we're gonna be offering this event. Uh, when Mary Lee and I uh, were talking about having an event, she had the great idea of making it a series because uh, there's so much more to keep talking about. And so we have a panel next week that involves 
um, three different practitioners in the art world discussing how the legacy of Nazi art plunder affects their work. We have Renee Albiston, who is the Associate Museum Director of the Kirkland Museum of Fine and Decorative Art in Denver, and also has worked as a provenance researcher at the Denver Art Museum. Uh, we have Nicholas O'Donnell, who I mentioned earlier, who is a partner at uh, uh, Sullivan and Worcester in Boston, and who is representing the plaintiffs in the case that was recently before the, the Supreme Court. In addition, we have Gus Capriva, owner of Redbud Gallery in Houston. He's also a collector with expertise in German expressionism and French symbolism and contemporary art. So we're gonna have a museum staff member, provenance researcher, attorney, and a gallery owner and collector. And I'll be moderating that discussion. And I think it will be, um, it will be really fascinating to hear all of their insights uh, following up on tonight's discussion. Okay. Well, with that, this has been a really, truly amazing um, program, as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> so it's good to be right. Um, but you're a very, very gifted um, speaker and researcher. So thank you, thank you for illuminating um, these complicated topics for us. Um, I think there have been some really interesting things put into the Q&A that um, we will share with each other as we debrief and um, see if we can bring some of those forward next week in the discussion and also then offer some resources for those. So yes, and that it's a great benefit of having a follow up event. So we'll take a look at those questions and uh, we'll do our best to address them next week. So please join us next week at the same time. Thank you so much, everyone, for being with us tonight. Um, we can't tell about your rapt attention, but um, most of you are still with us. So that's one indication that all was good. So thank you very, very much. It's very important to our institutions um, that people have interest in the connections that Elizabeth talked about, the connection back to the Holocaust, what this matters. Um, why it still matters to us. And Steve asked another great question about what do we do about the fact that most of the people involved in this are now very, very elderly. Um, yes. And that creates also some interesting le legal repercussions. So on to next week. More, if I oh. might, really, I have one more very important person to thank the, who brought us together. I meant to thank right at the outset, uh, Amelia, Kleinman, who was a DU alumna, who had the idea from the outset of bringing together the University of Denver and these institutions in Houston, both the, the Holocaust Museum Houston and Rice University. So thank you very much to Amelia for having that insight that this would be such a wonderful partnership. And thanks also to Amelia for her tenacity and um, not giving up on us when we were just having a heck of a time of scheduling. So for your patience, thank you very much and thank you for your great idea. So good night everyone and we'll hope to see you next week. Mm -hmm.